Lorna, welcome. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to get started now because we have a, a lot of material uh, to cover in these four sessions. So these classes are a part of a, a continuing series that began two years ago um, when we uh, studied the afterlife in, in Jewish tradition and lore. Um, if you recall, those of you who were on, on then, we, we talked about um, looking at what Judaism has to say about the afterlife through uh, the phenomenon of Jewish grave pilgrimages, particularly in Israel and also other places. Um, and then we uh, move to um, uh, the idea of resurrection in Judaism, especially as, as it is uh, shown in the, our liturgy, uh, in our Siddur. And then last year, we, we did six sessions on the Kaddish and its uh, origin and evolution, and including the music of, of the Kaddish. And now we're moving on to, uh, to death uh, in Jewish tradition and war. Um, Welcome, Howard, Gerilyn, Merle. Uh, Gerilyn and Merle are from our sister Shul in Montclair, Shamri Muna. Welcome. Okay. Um, so um, I may ask you at different points to read, um, and, and uh, I will also read. Uh, this first section I wrote um, after the events of October, October 7th. Um, most of the material that you're going to see um, did over the summer um, and uh, earlier this fall, but uh, after um, October 7th, I, I needed a different introduction. Uh, and it's kind of different from the rest of what I'm going to be talking about, but I, I just couldn't ignore it. <laughs> so some of this material may, may be upsetting. There actually um, isn't that much written uh, in, in the popular press uh, that, that I came across in terms of the deaths that occurred uh, in southern Israel. So some, some of this material may be disturbing to you. So hold your questions off to the end of this section. It's, it's not too long. Okay. Recording in progress. Okay. Um, so here, this was uh, on October 10th, uh, one of the soldiers who was killed. Um, at, at, uh, so we, we, at least we knew who this soldier was. Uh, but uh, there were many people uh, who, who died in the massacre that we, we, we Still being identified, actually. So I, I so the the Bible of of uh, understanding death in Jewish tradition is this well-known book by Morris Lamb. It's been in three editions, uh, and and it's got 300 pages, but there's not one word in it about uh, that speaks to how we deal with the deaths that happened in southern Israel uh, on on October 7th. Not one word. Um, so uh, which I uh, <laughs> thought was interesting. Um, so there's an article I came across from, uh, from the New York Sun, which is a, an online newspaper from a few days after the, the, the massacre, October 12th, by the publisher, is David Ephon. Um, and uh, Anne, could you take us through this? Sure. <laughs> Burial of the dead is a meticulous process in the Jewish tradition. Bodies are thoroughly cleaned, groomed, and nails are cut. Then, in a ritual known as Tahara, purification, the body is immersed in a pool of cold water known as a mikvah. Not so for the more than 1,300 victims of Saturday's assault on Southern Israel. They are considered to have the unique status of kedoshim, holy ones or martyrs in Jewish law. When it comes to someone who was killed, al kedush Hashem, for the, sacri for the sanctification of God's name, Jewish law dictates that we don't touch anything, explains Rabbi Eliada Goldwick. The way the person is found is the way that he's buried. He is buried with his clothing, with his shoes, with his pants, with everything that's on. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, could, are you able to read for us this morning? Or actually, Susan, I'm going to ask you, Susan Gordon. If I don't see your picture, I'm not going to ask you to read. <laughs> Susan. The deceased mourner doesn't need purification because they have already attained the pinnacle of holiness due to the nature of their death, explains Rabbi Goldwick. They got killed because they identified as a Jew and they have a special place in the hearts of the Jewish people and they have a special place in heaven. They come up dressed differently and that's meant to awaken the heavens and shake things up. The origins of this tradition can be traced to the Talmud some 1,500 years ago. 
Tractate Baba Batra describes martyrs as enjoying such an exalted status in Judaism that no one can stand in their section. Please go on. There are few people who have come into contact with the bodies of as many martyrs as Rabbi Goldwick has. As a reservist in an Israeli Defense Forces search and rescue unit, he's been working since the weekend in 12-hour shifts at the IDF Rabbinitz Shura base near Ramla in central Israel to identify and prepare hundreds of bodies for burial. Most of the bodies he's processed are those of young men and women who attended a music festival near the Gaza border on the morning of the attack. They were ambushed and gunned down by Hamas terrorists as they fled. Some were burned alive. Thank you, Susan. Wendy, could you read for us? Wendy, could you unmute, please? Okay. Er, okay. There you go. Got it. Ten large shipping containers were hastily added to the Shura's base's infrastructure to handle the volume of bodies. When Rabbi Goldwich arrived, he says he was greeted by an army commander who told the reservists, you are going to see things that you've never seen in your life. The group then paused at a prayer for the Book of Psalms and the Kaddish prayer for the dead, and then climbed up onto a truck and started offloading bodies. They worked fast and diligently to identify bodies without stopping or resting in order that they might save a minute or five minutes of anguish for the families of the deceased. Continue. On Monday, October 9th, an Israeli government official presented the group with a quandary. They had already identified close to 50 bodies from the devastated Kibbutz Be'eri and could not locate any next of kin to take possession of the bodies and organize the burials. We have no known living family members, the unnamed official said. The families are missing. They are either taken captive or killed. Were not yet and not yet identified. Showing utmost respect in the handling of the bodies is also fundamental, Rabbi Goldwish explained. Bodies are never thrown or dropped. We ask for forgiveness if a body is moved. Stepping over a body is also forbidden. If a drop of blood comes out, we collect it and wipe it off the floor so that it can be buried with the deceased. Come on. How does Rabbi Goldwich find the strength to perform this grim task for hours on end? Finally, it is not the knowledge. Firstly, is the knowledge that they are providing a service for the Jewish people and for the families of the victims, knowing that their children are taken care of. Second, it is showing the respect for life that the Jewish people have, how much we respect every individual even after death. Every person is a world. It says in the Torah that a person was created in the image of God, and every human being is a piece of God. That's how we Thank view you. it. Thank you, Hank. Lily, can you read for us? You need to unmute. I'm sorry, where are we up to? I wasn't as of early, it. can you see that? Okay, as of early in November, there were still dozens of bodies, or more upsettingly, parts of bodies that were not yet identified. The delays in identification and burial add enormous pain to those who have lost a loved one. A core Jewish value is that the deceased is to be buried as soon as possible. Among the reasons for this practice is the belief that upon burial, the soul is released and free to ascend to heaven. Traditionally, until the dead are buried, the, for, the family cannot begin formally to grieve. Like the soul of the person who has died, they are both in limbo. Come on. In yesterday's, in yesterday's November 12th, Sunday, New York Times, columnist Brett Stevens, reporting from Jerusalem, writes that the situation is still the case. From a funeral, I drove to the morgue at Shura Arm Base, where a forensics team opened trailer-sized containers of bagged corpses in cold storage. Even at low temperatures, the smell left no doubt as to what was inside. Yila Bahat, a police investigator, inscribed, examined babies who had been shot and burned, people who had been, people who had been decapitated after being killed, and a gruesome hodgepodge of hard-to-identify arms, skulls, and other remains. Never have we seen such a sight, Bahat said. He's been on the force for 27 years. Okay, so um, it's hard to swallow this. Um, so any, any comments or questions? Uh, I don't want to have a, a, a lot of discussions. We have a lot of material this morning, but any, any reactions or uh, 
questions you have about this material and how it's different from uh, our experiences of uh, mourning loved ones um, and, and burial. <laughs> Okay, let's let you digest that for a moment. Um, so it's just uh, upsetting. That's just it is upsetting, and uh, to to read this and come across this, and you just don't see a lot a lot in in uh, in the in the press, you know, in these, you know, talking about this because it is it is so upsetting. Yes. So I'm going to move now to actually where I was going to begin uh, today, uh, which is about how uh, death occurs. Oh, Merle, you have a question? Yes. I was just going to make. Um, in addition to the horror of the fall, um, I wasn't aware that martyrs were buried, uh, the ritual re regarding martyrs was different than the ritual regarding everybody else. That was something, you know, brand new for me. And for me as well, I, I had no idea uh, about that. Um, and uh, there's nothing I, I come across earlier in re doing the research for this uh, piece these presentations that spoke to that at all. So we, we're in an entirely new situation. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to move on to uh, how death occurs in our tradition, and uh, uh, it, it, it occurs by <laughs> the angel of death. Uh, we're going to become acquainted uh, with with this fellow. Um, and there aren't too many paintings. Uh, you know, in, in museums, uh, there's lots of biblical scenes represented by Christian artists. Uh, but not so much about uh, the angel of death because um, it, guess what? It's not in the quote Old Testament and it's not in the New Testament. Nothing in the Hebrew Bible about about a, a, a malach hamavet, malach uh, and uh, nothing in the New Testament uh, either. You know, but there are some works of art, and of course in Har Haggadah. Uh, you know, we, we find that this is from Anne's father's Haggadah, published uh, actually pre-war in Vienna. Here we have, uh, uh, we don't see the angel of death, but, but the angel is killing the shaykhet, the slaughterer, okay, in that picture. And here, here comes Aviata Malacha Mavet Shochet. Here comes the angel of death and kills the slaughterer from that Haggadah. Um, it's here. Um, um, Cantor Anna, could you read for us? Would you be so kind as to read for us? Sure. In Jewish lore, all death occurs by the hand of the angel of death, Malach HaMavet. Yet the only reference to this angel in the Hebrew Bible, and that is debatable, is found in Proverbs 16.4. Can you read the Hebrew for us? Yeah, I, okay, hold it. My thing is in the way. All right. Hamat Melech, Malachi Mavet, the Ish Chacham, Yechaprena. The king's wrath is a messenger of death, but a wise man can appease it. The angel of death begins to appear as a personification yeah. of of death in Jewish writings. We did from that clip I made. If, if somebody, for well, could you mute yourself because you're, we're getting interference? You'll need to uh, to mute yourself. Thank I'm you. Sorry, I'm, not, I'm only on a small cell phone. I went down to the temple to find out that I had to come home. Okay. <laughs> Just the angel yourself. of death begins to appear as a personification of death in Jewish writings in the first century CE. The Talmud, second to fifth century CE, does not stint from discussing the angel of death, describing its appearance, methods of bringing about death, ways to argue with it, and even stratagems to attempt to fool it and forestall death. In the Talmud, the angel of death becomes a fully developed and partially independent character. In the centuries that followed, the angel of death assumed a major role in Jewish folklore, particularly in the medieval period. However, the angel of death in Judaism is never regarded as an entity separate from God. As if to bolster this point, there is a midrash stating that the angel of death was created by God on the first day of creation. So we say that God is the one who who enlivens us and and all, you know uh, also takes away our lives. Everything is is God uh, upon death. We say Baruch Adayan Dayan Ha'emet, right? So, but yet we have this creature that uh, we find in the early centuries uh, of the Common Era is already being being talked about a lot. Thank you, Cantor. My parents uh, would mention. My parents would talk about the Malach mm -hmm. and when my father was in the hospital, my mother said, "You know, the Malach lives here. You have to be careful. Don't push it," because he was he was a little 
he was a little nervous and crazy. But the Malach HaMavis lived in the hospital. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that one, but we're going to be going through what we have more, more interesting folklore about that. But yes, it, there's, there's a lot of legends about uh, the Malach HaMavet. Yes. Hmm? Thank you for that, Lily. Um, Malach HaMavet is in uh, Chad Gadya. Yes, we are, yes, I just, yeah, exactly so. We're going to be, we're going to be talking, you know, we, I, yes. Um, okay. Um, Marion, are you able uh, to read for us or would you rather not? Okay. Um, Okay, Dan, are you able to read for us this morning? Okay, so let's take us through some of the biblical, sorry, the Talmudic citations about the Malach HaMavet. They said about the angel of death that he is entirely full of eyes. When a sick person is about to die, the angel of death stands above his head with his sword drawn in his hand and a drop of poison hanging on the edge of the sword. Once the sick person sees him, he trembles and thereby opens his mouth. And the angel of death throws the drop of poison into his mouth. From this drop of poison, the sick person dies. From it, he, purif he putrefies. From it, his face becomes green. Delightful. Go on. Delightful? I don't know if I would describe <laughs> it. <that. laughs> <clears throat> David knew that he was to die on a Shabbat. What did David do? Every Shabbat, he would sit and learn all day long to protect himself from the angel of death. On that day on which the angel of death was supposed to put his soul to rest, the day on which David was supposed to die, the angel of death stood before him and was unable to overcome him because his mouth did not pause from study. The angel of death said, what shall I do to him? David had a garden behind his house. The angel of death came, climbed, and shook the trees. David went out to see. As he climbed the stair, the stair broke beneath him. He was startled and was silent, interrupting the study for a moment, and died. <laughs> Can't outsmart the angel of death. Go on, uh, Dan. Moet Katan, 28a. The Gemara continues a discussion of the deaths of the righteous. Here are two samples. Rav Se'orim, Rava's brother, sat before Rava, and he saw that Rava was dozing, meaning he was about to die. Rava said to his brother, Master, tell him, the angel of death, not to torment me. Knowing that Rava was not afraid of the angel of death, Rav Seorim said to him, Master, are you not a friend of the angel of death? Rava said to him, Since my fate has been handed over to him, and it has been decreed that I shall die, the angel of death no longer pays heed to me. Rav Seorim said to Rava, Master, appear to me in a dream after your death. And Rava appeared to him. Rav Seorim said to Rava, Master, did you have pain in death? He said to him, like the prick of the knife when letting blood. Not too bad. Go on. <laughs> Rava said to Rav Nachman, Master, did you have pain in death? Rav Nachman said to him, like the removal of a hair from milk, which is a most gentle process. But nevertheless, were the Holy One, blessed be he, to say to me, go back to that world, the physical world, as you were, I would not want to go. For fear of the angel of death is great. And I would not want to go through such a terrifying experience a second time. Speaking of the most sought type of death, like the removal of a hair from milk above, we take a brief sidebar, some probable origins of the phrase kiss of death. Okay, so it's interesting here that um, it's not death itself that was so um, painful, but rather the, the fear of the angel of death. You know. Okay, um, Howard, can you read to us? He was taught in the Baraita, 900, and three types of death were created in the world, as it is stated. The issuing of out of death, and that 903 is a numerical value of issuing. So here the we Gemara, have, the word, totsa, hold on a second. So totsa'ot means the, it's the issue out, the hotzi, you know, to take out. Uh, and there's a uh, mystical way of equating words by pulling the nu numerical value associated with each number, and that's called gematria, because gimel is three, gimel tre, right? So for the issue we out, totsa uh, so they, they say from that, that there's 903 ways you, you can die. <laughs> Go on, Howard. <laughs> the Gemara explains that the most difficult of all of these types of death is croup. While the easiest is the kiss of death, croup 
is like a thorn entangled in a wool fleece, which when pulled out backwards tears the wool. Some say that croup is like ropes at the entrance to the esophagus, which would be nearly impossible to insert and excruciating to remove. The kiss of death is like drawing a hair from milk. One should pray that he does not die a painful death. This reminds me of, of one of my dad's uh, famous sayings. He says, one should have, uh, Allah you know, he would always say, one should have a good life and one should have a good death. You know, so it brings to mind my dad, yeah. Go on, Howard. Here are the words in Aramaic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them for you. Nishika, which means kiss, like I mean, Nishika Damya is like Kimbachal, like taking out Benita Mechaleva, you know, a, a, a strand of uh, hair from milk. Halav is milk. We, we know that word. Go on, Howard. The likely original source for dying by a kiss of death stems from Rashi's hyperliteral interpretation of Moses' death in Deuteronomy 34.5 where he dies, Alpi Adonai, while Alpi is an idiom meaning by the word or, or of or command of God, Rashi understood it as by the mouth of God. Oh, this he is well. I came down this mouth. Well, hold on, hold on, please, Flo well, Ellen, you need, to, you need to mute yourself. We're, we're hearing you and it's interrupting uh, the class. Okay. You need to turn off your phone or mute your, figure out how to mute yourself. Because when you talk, the whole class is interrupted. So please try to do that. Can Thank you. Can you mute her, Lynn? Pardon? Usually, usually I can't. I don't have uh, the power to, to, to. Who's the host? Uh, you are. I don't know how to mute her. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. Go on, please, Howard. <laughs> uh, here is another key citation, this time mentioning both the angel of death and the most desired way to die, the kiss, the kiss of death. Um, okay. um, the sages taught, this is uh, from Babylonian Talmud, Baba Batra, there were six people over whom the angel of death had no sway in their demise. They are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as it's written with regard to them, with everything and from everything. Everything since they were blessed with everything. They were certainly spared the, the anguish of the angel of death. Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, it is written with regard to them that they died by the mouth of the Lord, Alpi Adonai, which indicates that they died with a kiss and not at the hand of the angel of death. So Tom loves arguments like that. And one last citation about the angel of death, pedestrians and shulgoers, beware. Anne, can you read? Sure. Um, the sage is taught if there is a plague in the city, a person should not walk in the middle of the road due to the fact that the angel of death walks in the middle of the road. Since in heaven they have given him permission to kill within the city, in the case of plague, he goes openly in the middle of the road. By contrast, if there is peace and quiet in the city, do not walk on the sides of the road. Since the angel of death does not have permission to kill within the city, he hides himself and walks on the side of the road. The sage is taught, if there is a plague in the city, a person should not enter the synagogue alone, as the angel of death leaves his utensils there. And for this reason, it is a dangerous place. And this matter, the danger in the synagogue applies only when there are no children learning in the synagogue. And there are not 10 men praying in it. But if there are children learning or 10 men praying there, it is not a dangerous place. Okay, so don't walk around the shul unless there are kids in the, in, in the religious school right? or, or a prayer going on is the moral there. So during the medieval period, Jewish writings and tales about the angel of death proliferated. My favorite is found in everyone's favorite Seder song, Chad Gadja, the Cantal Honor mentioned. In the penultimate verse, the angel of death kills the Shaykh the slaughterer. But in the final verse, God, kills the Malachamav at the angel of death. This alludes to the bodily resurrection that will occur at the end of the days when Mashiach comes, when there'll be no more death. The death. Uh, 
Oh boy. Uh, okay. Uh, here, here comes uh, the Holy One, blessed be He, and slaughters. Um, we lose the screen share. We lose the screen share here. Hold on. Oh uh, boy. Something happened here. Oh uh, boy. L let me. Your laughter is unmuted. Do uh, you have everybody here? you get every, everybody back in the view panel? Okay, and I'm going to... Yes, thank you. Amanda's still here? Yeah. Yeah, Gail's box is the one that is lighting up when there's talking. Gail Adler. Okay, so I'm going to play just a little clip about the 10th plague personified, because maybe... Where do we... Wait, we're still not getting it. Are, are you not seeing that? We're hold on, let me... It. Hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, boy. Something. Uh, yeah, a Amanda, hold on. Huh. Okay, hold on. Uh, boy, I'm going to have to get out of this. Uh, I'm, I think I lost this, huh? Right. Len, Amanda. Yeah. Yeah, there's Amanda. Yeah. Tell me what to do. I wasn't saying no yesterday, but I'm here. Okay. So you're trying to share it. So if you go down. To screen share at the bottom. Somebody is not muted. Somebody knocked me off. Hold on. Uh, Amanda. Yeah, I'm muting everybody. Gail Adler is not now. Gail okay, yes, Susan. I was going to say, if you make me a co host, I can mute people. Perfect. Thank you. I will. I don't, I don't know how to. I'll I'll take yeah. care of it, Len. Once she makes me a co-host. Okay. 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 Meanwhile, gotcha. we lost screen sharing. Ah, you get it now. I'm not getting can, it. Can, are you seeing the picture on the on the screen? No, no, it's not there. Oh, they. Okay. So then, I, Len, go back down to the yeah, bottom. Do you see the screen screen share arrow? Um, uh, I'm sorry for these technical difficulties. Hopefully, in a minute. Now, we'll uh, straighten that out. Yes, okay. Your okay. is on a call in three minutes. All right. Uh, but she's coming down. Yeah, my, my daughter happens to be with us and she's tech savvy and hopefully we'll get us get back, us back here. on. All right. <laughs> uh, what happened? Uh, can, can, I, I can't. I, I lost Get everything. Get out of the way and should let her. Yeah. Know. What are you trying to do? Uh, Get to screen share. It disappeared. Uh, and, and the Zoom it disappeared. Oh, this is still. Something there. I don't know. Okay. Blow that up. Yeah. Okay. Now yeah. get get my screen share, and go over here, and and optimize this, and that, and share. Can everybody see this now? Yes. Yeah. Yep, you're good. I see it. We're yep, good. yep, yep. You are back. <laughs> Yay, Jordana. Yay, Amanda. Thank you. So let's see if this works here. From the Prince of Egypt. <laughs> Just a little bit of this. It, it is dark. Don't worry that you can't see it. You will in a moment. I'm going to try to blow this up again. Okay. Oh, uh, I'm going to play it. Okay. You know what? I, I'm going to skip this. But you, you, if you remember the Prince of Egypt, you know what that that is. Okay. So, um, Susan Cohn, can you read for us? Aaron Hurt Mannheimer writing in Reform Judaism in 2016, tells this anecdote about his Holocaust survivor mother. When my mother was born in the Polish town of Dobroa Gornicza in 1921, her Hasidic parents sought their Rebbe's advice on how to protect their infant from the sword of Malachamavit, the angel of death. They had good reason to fear 
They had lost a son and daughter in the scarlet fever epidemic of 1909, which was followed by the outbreak of World War I in 1914 and the worldwide influenza pandemic in 1918. The angel of death, it seems, was insatiable. Here's what you must do, the Rebbe said, instructing them to, one, name their daughter Alta Fruma, which means old and religiously observant, change her date of birth by not counting the first year of her life, dress her only in white until she turns seven years old. Go on. Why do names or birthdays matter? The first two strategies, changing the name and date of birth, were intended to throw the angel of death off track. In Jewish folklore, the Malach HaMavet was a messenger of God who was not considered bright or brave. Parents named newborns after scary animals. Arye, lion, dove, bear, zev, wolf, or stinging insects, devora, bee, to frighten away the angel of death. Why wear only white? Evil spirits were thought to dwell in the shadows, shun the light, act at night, and be repulsed by the color white. This notion gave rise to brides and grooms wearing white at weddings. It was believed that most encounters with the angel of death occurred on the wedding night when either the bride or groom was a target. The idea of white representing purity or innocence was a later interpretation states Hurt Mannheimer. I didn't know that. And <laughs> kind of fascinating, right? So, yeah. Oh. Um, you don't hear about a lot of people dying on their wedding night. <laughs> That's because they wear white. There you go. Uh, shows to go, yeah. Can you continue, Susan? Rabbi Ari Enkin in OU Online writes about Shinui Shem, the custom of changing the name of a person who is severely ill. Doing so is said to assist in improving their condition, i.e. avoiding death. Citing Midrashic references, he talks of a belief that if illness and death were decreed on a particular person, changing that person's name can fool the evil decree of Satan or the angel of death. Satan is at times conflated with the angel of death in rabbinic literature can fool the devil or Satan into believing that the ill person is actually someone else. As a result of this error, any such decree is dismissed and the person recovers. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Um, Dale Alder, would you like to read for us? Yes, uh, I'll read this next one. Indeed, Rabbi Enkin writes, the Talmud itself teaches that changing the name of one who is ill has the power to eradicate any evil decree that may have been decreed upon that person. He references uh, from the Babylonian ta uh, Talmud Rosh Hashanah, uh, which states, and Rabbi Yitzchak said, a person's sentence is torn up on account of four types of actions. These are giving charity, giving prayer, a change of one's name, a change of one's deeds for the better. Rabbi Yeser goes on to cite biblical verses in support of these death-avoiding practices. Regarding changing names, he says, common custom is to add a name to one who is ill rather than to change it completely. When this is done, the added name usually precedes the given one. Some of the more prominent names that are used when adding a name include Raphael, Chaim, and Shalom for men, and Chana and Sarah for women. Some have the custom to randomly open a chumash or tanach and to use the first name that they see. He questions that a person's name should only be changed in the presence of a minion, and preferably in shul during the Torah reading service. Um, okay. um, Geraldine, would you like to be able, can you read for us if you unmute? Sure. Rabbi Jeffrey Dennis in Jewish Myth. Magic and Mysticism, writes of the angel of death. Fearful that the angel will use a person's name to find him or her, some Jewish parents will not name newborns until the day of their circumcision or synagogue naming, when they enjoy the added protection of Jewish ritual. 
symbolically selling an ill child, changing its name or giving away its clothing to someone else can confuse the angel of death. Rabbi Dennis adds that the reason for omitting the customary prayers for Rosh Chodesh for the month of Tishrei is in order to mislead the angel of death about the coming high holidays, the time when it is determined who will die in the coming year. Right, so Rosh Hashanah is Yom Hadin, the day of judgment. Uh, we're, are we going to live or die? Uh, and how are we going to die? So we don't want the angel to know, the of death, Malach and to know it's coming. So we don't announce in Shul the coming uh, Rosh Chodesh of Tishrei. Um, yeah. And, and I never quite realized that we we wait to, to a baby's naming in Shul before <laughs> giving the name traditionally. Um, so that uh, you know that the baby is protected by having the name given in, in shul, and nothing bad could happen until that point. Um, can you continue, Carolyn? If I have a new screen, it's still the same screen. Oh, really? Hold on. Let me. It's where it says no one wants Hebrew name. Can you see that? It's all blurred now. It's not. Oh, I hope. I hope uh, is everyone else? Blurred? Can everybody I see can. the screen? It's okay. fine here. We can see knowing one's name once he. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, Cantor Lorna, could you read for us? Oh, Flo Ellen. Oh, Flo uh, Ellen, you wanted to read? Go on. Knowing one's Hebrew name is essential in order to avoid some of the immediate torments that is said to occur upon one's death. A notable 16th century Kabbalistic work that is still studied today among the Orthodox, Rashid Chochma by Rabbi Eliyahu Davidas, 1518 to 1587, states that when a person departs from this world, the angel of death comes and sits on his grave and commands him, quote, rise and tell me your name, end quote. If the dead person says, quote, the creator of the world is my witness that I cannot remember it, end quote, the angel breathes life back into him and he is brought to judge immediate judgment. In other versions of this belief, it is an angel called Duma that is the interrogator. The judgment carried out is not the ultimate one that will determine the fate of the soul, but rather a preliminary one involving what is known as Chibut Hakavar, the thrashing of the grave, a brief but exceedingly painful post-mortem period that can be avoided by recalling one's name. Yeah, we'll be talking about that later on. Go on, Flo Ellen. I don't have any more, oh, here, okay. Philogus, writing in a 2019 Mosaic article, notes a Jewish folkloric remedy <clears throat> to avoid this fate. A mnemonic would be created by an individual based on a verse from the book of Psalms having the same first and last letters as his or her name. Compilations of such verses were in circulation, and it was customary to recite one's verse regularly at the end of every Amidah, which is said three times daily. The question can be asked, how can anyone be expected to remember a verse from Psalms if he or she cannot remember the name for which the verse is a mnemonic? Philogus retorts that the question misses the psychological point. The inability to remember one's name is due to death being a profoundly disoriented, a disorienting experience that shatters one's sense of self the dead self soul retaining a consciousness of sorts. The verse from Psalms has a tranquilizing effect that restores the shock, shocked soul's memory. Thus, Philogus concludes, the Bible stands by even when one's own name has deserted one. Okay, so be sure to, to remember your Hebrew name when, when our moment comes or else have a mnemonic. So otherwise we, 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 don't, we don't want what's gonna happen if we can't remember. <laughs> Thank you, Flo Ellen. So Islam also has a belief in the angel of death, uh, likely stemming from Jewish tradition. And even the name is similar uh, from the Hebrew Malach uh, In Arabic, it's a Malachul Mat. So I have a video, which I'm gonna skip right now. Um, and with an imam talking like a, a, an Orthodox rabbi, very, very in a stentorian manner, about how the angel of uh, the Malachamot 
comes five times a day when people are praying and he knows each person intimately. So you better do your prayers. And uh, because when it's time to meet your maker, you know, he, he's got, got to know what a good uh, Muslim you are. Anyway, I'm going to skip that. And from the Christian website regarding the angel of death, Christian tradition, the archangel Michael, uh, Michael supervises all of the angels who work with dying people. Michael appears to each person just prior to the moment of death to give the person the last chance to consider the spiritual state of their soul. Those who are not yet saved or change their minds at the last moment can be redeemed by telling Michael with faith that they say yes to God's offer of salvation, they can go to heaven rather than to hell when they die. So all, all three religions have, have a concept of the angel of death, uh, but uh, none, none from, the, uh, from the Quran or from the Bible itself. A related figure to the angel of death is that of the Grim Reaper, whose origin lies in the Black Death of 1348. And here we have from the, uh, how many of you have been to Prague and have seen the astronomical clock, right? So, and here's a detail from it uh, with the angel of death there. Uh, and the, uh, the Black Death parenthetically was responsible for mass scale persecution of Jewish communities in Europe as Christians view the Jews as responsible for the plague. As somber as a subject of death is, yet there's a human need to laugh at it. Perhaps that is the motive around Jewish Midrashim about fooling and outsmarting the angel of death. Same is true in the development of the notion of the Grim Reaper. So I invite you to watch the short uh, YouTube on the phenomenon of the Grim Reaper cartoons that appeared in the New Yorker. This is the Grim Reaper, personification of death, a cultural icon, and a popular fixture of the New Yorker's famous cartoons for the last 80 years. In addition to his many appearances on late night TV, early morning cartoons, and movies, Grim Reaper, the Grim Reaper has appeared in over 104 cartoons since 1937. In this one, he's taking a coffee break, reaping the stale baked goods. Here, He's come to collect the soul of a dead toaster. And sometimes, he just wants to pop your balloon. The more you look at New Yorker cartoons that feature the Grim Reaper, the more you notice he's always the butt of the joke. So why do we do this? Why do we have this urge to laugh in the face of death? We first have to address why death has a face at all. Death is a lot like pasta. Every culture deals with it in their own way. The image of death as a shepherd or ferryman to the underworld has been found in cultures around the globe. Early North American cave paintings featured otherworldly characters accompanying departed humans on the path of souls. The ancient Greeks had Sharon, and the Mexicans, to this day, celebrate Santa Muerte. Like many religious or spiritual icons, personifications of death are coping mechanisms to communicate a complicated, scary, or mysterious idea of what happens to your soul after passing from this world. The Reaper is no different. His dark and terrifying appearance is a reflection of the world he came from, a world gripped by fear in the midst of one of the deadliest events in human history, the Black Plague. The plague was a daily nightmare. It crept through Europe and Asia, killing hundreds of millions of people. Images have a power to structure a human relationship with the event. An image like the Grim Reaper is a moral assurance that death is fair. There are all kinds of stories coming from the late Middle Ages about the fact that death is very democratic. It takes everybody. It takes bishops, it takes princes, it takes women, it takes children, to everybody. Medieval artists began using skeletons as a shorthand for death, as all around them, bodies were piled in the streets, rotting down to their bones. Don Smacabre depicted skeletons dancing and playing musical instruments to coax the living to their graves. Humans were fighting a war with death, and they were losing badly. We've come a long way from the earliest grim depictions of death. The New Yorker's cartoonists have replaced the grim with the glum, while laughing at the absurdity and complexity of modern life. For medieval artists, illustrating a society downsized by the plague, their reaper used everyday objects like swords or crossbows. But it was the two-handed scythe that became the natural choice for the agrarian society of medieval Europe. The scythe was significantly more efficient and productive than the ancient one-handed sickle. With it, death could mow down huge swaths of the population. Death became a reaper. The New Yorker's depictions of the reaper have the tools to match the times. 
It's funny to imagine Death stripped of his iconic weapon and replaced with the latest trend in multi-blade technology, or giving him a microphone to kill it at the comedy club. <laughs> Laughing can psychologically help us deal with trauma, and morbid jokes are a fixture of comedy. Dude, bad news. You're dead. But the New Yorker cartoons are playing to something more primal. The best satire speaks truth to power. Like when a co-worker cracks a joke about your boss, or death being a stand-in for a corrupt politician. Comedy feels good when it's aimed at a perpetrator of injustice. And the Grim Reaper looms large at the top of that totem pole. Death is more powerful than anything or anyone. The perpetrator of the greatest injustice in the universe. That we all die. Here's the Grim Reaper's first appearance in a New Yorker cartoon. He's requesting a boat with muffled oars. It's horrifying to think of death moving silently across the water. But it's less scary to think of the mundanity his job entails. This is why we so often see the Grim Reaper in pop culture doing silly or human things. The Reaper was invented during the plague to cope with the horrors of mortality. And really, not much has changed. Despite our effort to cheat death by running on treadmills or eating kale, the Grim Reaper is always on his way. And while we wait for our time to come, all we can do is laugh. It may not be much, but it's a brief respite from the existential grip that death holds. After all, when death comes knocking at the door, he could just be a sore throat. <coughs> okay. Any comments about uh, that or anything about uh, the angel of death or Grim Reaper or <laughs> Kiss of Death? Different perspective. Yeah? We're going to move on uh, to the next section uh, about the history of Jewish burial rites. Okay. And Cantor Lorna, could you take us through the next few slides? Sure. Life review. Returning to some of the selections from the Talmud we have looked at, and these are just a sample, it is clear that the rabbis in antiquity were much concerned with what happens beyond death. In the Midrash, as well, as well are many statements revealing an assumption that there was some kind of post-mortem conscious awareness. This begins at the moment of death, when the deceased are shown a panoramic view of all the deeds in their lives and has to sign off on it, as it were. Uh, this is from uh, Talmud uh, Tanit 11a. The sages said, at the hour of a person's departure to his eternal home, all his deeds are enumerated before him and are rendered visible to him once again. And the deeds themselves say to him, you did such and such in such and such a place on such and such a day, and he says, yes, that is exactly what happened. And they say to him, sign a statement that this is correct. And he signs it as it is stated, quote, he makes the hand of every man sign, end quote, that's from Job 37, 7. And not only that, but after one has been shown all his deeds, he justifies the judgment upon himself and says to them, you have judged me well. Come on. Everything, absolutely everything, is shown to the deceased in the life review that occurs upon death, as in the below. And this is from the Talmud Chagiga 5b. The Gemara asks, what is the meaning of the phrase? What is his speech? Rav said, even frivolous speech, that is between a man and his wife before engaging in relations, is declared to a person at the time of death and he will have to account for it. The Pasikta Rab Rabati, a ninth century compilation of a Gothic Midrash, notes that each individual, while alive, has an angel assigned to him or, or her that records every deed, every day. Think the Truman Show writ large. When the jig is up, each of us has to answer for our deeds and points us in the direction of getting our just rewards. The idea of a post-mortem life review is also seen in other cultures and traditions. Thank you, Cantor. Dan, Dr. Bonnie, can you take us through the soul? Guiding the evolution of Jewish burial rites is the idea of the soul, which is post-biblical. At the moment of death, the soul is dislodged from the body and hovers over it. 
The soul is in a state of great confusion and agitation over its separation from the body. In rabbinic Judaism, this period is called Chibut HaKever, the pangs of the grave. Midrashim talk of the soul remaining in close proximity to the body as it tries to re-enter it for up to a week after death. Respect for the dead, Kavod Hamet, but also what became known as Tikkun Haneshamot, the mending of departed souls, are guiding principles, the development of Jewish funerary practices. While clergy today highlight that our burial customs are for the purpose of comforting the bereaved, historically they arose for the purpose of comforting the dead. Okay, and that's, that's that, this past, this last sentence, um, you're going to see evidence of that in much of what we're going to be talking about going forward, right? <laughs> that it's really the dead that uh, we want to <laughs> historically comfort in, in all the different rituals and practices uh, that have developed. Can you go on, Dan? The time of death. I had originally set out to find death, burial, and mourning customs that were uniquely Jewish. There are indeed some, but it turns out that most of the customs and traditions surrounding death among Jews also reflect practices from parts of the world in which Jews live. What we Jews have always done is to kosher these customs by giving them a Jewish flavor and basis. No Jewish community would want to be accused of merely assimilating to the larger culture. Particularly in the Middle Ages, rabbis of the period could be counted on to find an apt biblical verse which would show a purported Jewish ancestry and rationale for a particular custom. Thank you, Dan. Susan Gordon, can you read for us? There is a traditional Jewish custom, not much practice nowadays, that at the time of death, a candle is lit and a window opened. Presumably, the reason for opening a window is to allow the soul to pass out of the room. Yet others also have this custom. I found a reference to a still current Danish death tradition that when a loved one nears the end of his or her life in Denmark, a window is opened for the soul of the loved one to pass through. The reference states that it is a simple tradition, a swift gesture that takes little effort but says so much. Danish traditions are mostly a combination of Christian and pagan beliefs, and it is not uncommon to find candles in the windowsills of Danish households to commemorate the life of a loved one or to mark a holiday. Go on. Regarding candles, Rabbi Maurice Lamb in The Jewish Way in Death and Mourning describes various customs regarding the lighting of candles when a death occurs among Jews. Aside from the candle in the window, some have a custom that a candle should be placed near the head of the deceased, while others say that many candles should be placed around the deceased. Theodore Gaster in The Holy and the Profane, Evolution of Jewish Folkways, writes that the kindling of lights besides an unburied body and the use of torches at funerals are near universal practices and can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome. He notes that in cross-cultural folklore, funerary lamps are usually interpreted as a means of guiding the soul of the deceased to its eternal abode. Among Jews, the light is regarded as a symbol of the soul and a candle is lit in the Shiva house, which is to burn for seven days. At the cemetery where my parents are buried, I've noticed at, at some apparently Haredi graves there are little stands with a box in which a large candle can be placed and remain lit as, as, as it is protected from wind. Uh, so a question, you know, it, I've only noticed this maybe in the last 10 years. Have, have any of you noticed that in cemeteries or these boxes? Mm -hmm. Not so much? You, you have, Tank? What did you notice, Tank? Yes, well, I've seen it even in Woodbridge. Uh, where there's an area where there are a lot of uh, Hasidic uh, graves and they have these little boxes. And likewise, out of Long Island, I've seen it. Yeah, but I don't remember it, you know, in, the, in many years past, but relatively recently, you know, uh, to notice these. Uh, I, I assume that that's what, what it's for, that they place a large candle in it that can't be blown out, you know. So, yeah. okay. um, as long as I got your hand, could you continue? <laughs> 
Gaster, summarizing scholarly opinions, states that the original purpose of funerary lights was to keep away demons and evil spirits who mostly operate under the cover of darkness. There were common beliefs in the medieval period that demons were particularly active at a death, giving rise to the various customs surrounding death. This is seen in many cultures and in Jewish practices as well. And yes, Jews have believed in demons. Such beliefs were very strong among Jews in the Middle Ages and much earlier as well. The Talmud does not stint from discussing demons at various points and contexts. One way the rabbis kashered the use of funerary lights was to point to a relevant phrase from the Bible, including perhaps the one from Proverbs, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam, the life breath of man is the lamp of God. Although the concept of a soul is post-biblical, the phrase can be creatively translated peering man's soul with divine light, as such a phrase can be found on some synagogue walls next to the name plaques of deceased members. Okay, come on. Prayer at the time of death. What follows is from a Chabad article outlining the traditional prayers that are to be recited if one is conscious and able as death nears. The returning of one's soul, soul, one's soul to God at the end of its journey in this world is probably the most profound moment in a person's life. It is for this purpose that our sages prepared a special set of prayers called vidui, confessions, to be recited before one departs from this world. These prayers evoke God's mercy and bring great atonement upon the person. Vidui reminds us that what really matters is our relationship with God and with our fellow man, and not material possessions or accomplishments. It is a truly powerful message for everyone. One should not delay reciting vidui out of fear that it may be a bad omen. In fact, saying a vidui is helpful for one's recovery, as sincere repentance brings merit to the person and can nullify a severe decree from heaven. It is best for vidui to be recited with a clear mind. Therefore, one should say it before he becomes too weak. While there are various customs concerning the order of vidui prayers or different additions, the underlying theme remains the same. Thank you. Um, so the time between life and death is considered extremely sacred in Jewish tradition. On one hand, the passage marks the conclusion of the soul's journey on earth. On the other hand, death heralds the beginning of the soul's eternal life in, in heaven. Kabbalah teaches that at the moment of passing, every positive thought, word or deed that occurred during a person's life is concentrated into a pristine spiritual light. This light is revealed to the world and in heavenly spheres, where it continues to shine and have an effect uh, on those above and below. So I'm going to stop here at this point for, for today. We're going to continue um, with the Vidoy section uh, next week, but I just want to leave some time for comments or, or questions. Um, I'm going to stop my share here. Um, any comments or questions about <laughs> Uh, this material today, um, things you did not know before. <laughs> Merle. So reading about all this um, reminds me of when, when my mother died. Um, we, we hadn't been connected with the synagogue since my confirmation, which was 30 years before my mother died. But we did go back to the rabbi who was around when I was confirmed, although he had retired. So we met with him and he was comforting us and getting information for, uh, you know, his remarks at the funeral. And he said, and I didn't, I thought it was just a nice thing, but now hearing all this, I realized it was all part of the, the doctrine, let's say, of, of Jew, Jewish thought. He said something like, my mother had, so to speak, of like an, a very easy, calm death. She just sort of died. Um, she had cancer, but she, it was painless and it was very nice. So he said, you know, when, when a person is good, it's like they're um, given a kiss to, lead, you know, to be on their way. And without without going into any of this other detail, long detail that you you um, provided for us. And in one simple, you know, three or four word uh, sentence, it condensed the whole thing, and I'm, and I'm just realizing that right this second. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Merle, for sharing that. Other comments? I don't know if people are still. Lily, are you trying to speak? 
I don't know. If I don't people... know. Ooh, it's not working. Forget it. Getting an echo. Yeah. Oh, Mar Marion, are you trying to speak? Yeah, uh, you're on... I was going to say when I when my daughter was born, my grandmother said, "You got a red bendel on the crib, a red ribbon to ward off danger and death." Um, and the other thing is when in a marriage ceremony, when the groom circles the bride or the bride and groom circle each other, that's also to provide a circle to keep the evil spirits out. Yes, red, red is an anti-demonic uh, color, actually going back to the Bible, because how, how did the, the mashkit, the destroyer, know not to come to uh, the houses of the Israelites, right? They, they, there was a uh, red, you know, dom, you know, red blood uh, on the lintel, right? So red, red goes back actually to uh, the Bible times to being a uh, a way of uh, of uh, staving off uh, demons and circles also. Um, if we is Hani uh, the circle maker. There are many legends about Hani, uh, but if you make a circle, that that that, that is protective also of, of demons. Thank you for sharing that, Marion. Any other comments? Susan Cohn. Um, a few days ago, I was put, am I echoing? No. Okay. I was playing a board game with some non-Jewish friends. Now I'm hearing right. echoing. Echo. Lily, can you mute yourself? Lily Finkler? And Wendy? And Wendy? She's, okay. she's frozen. We can't, I can't mute her right now. Okay. Susan, try again, Susan Cohn. Okay, is this better? Yeah. Okay, so I was playing a word game with some non-Jewish friends, and we had to give a clue for people to guess words. And in order to guess, get people to guess, among other words, angel, the clue that was given was Noah. And to me, Noah does not at all bring up angel. So I asked them sort of when that round was over, what does Noah have to do with angels? And apparently in the, at least some Christian versions of the Noah story, angels came at the end and there was all this angel stuff. And I never realized that stories that are universal, I thought for Jews and Christians could be very different, but apparently you know, as far as I recall, and I kind of looked it up a little, I didn't have time to really pursue it. We don't have angels there, and they do. And I thought that Not was that right. story. Not in that story, but but Christians actually have taken the angel Michael and made that into uh, their uh, their angel of death. There's a whole Christological strand of that. Yeah. Any last comments before we end our session for today? <laughs> So I hope you found this edifying um, and uh, uh, come back for our, our next yes, session. Uh, we have three more to go on this uh, and I'll take you through even more aspects of this. Um, and uh, uh, I hope you got something out of this and uh, I hope to see you next, see you next week.